One of the first things you see as you walk into the Tank Museum at Bovington is this sign. It's a funny little triangle with firepower, protection, mobility at each tip. And this triangle in essence has been the basis of every single tank design ever made. It is the difference between light, medium and heavy tanks. It showcases the unique characteristics of a tank destroyer and it does a very good job of showing why the main battle tank dominates the modern battlefield. I'm sure you've heard all these classifications before, but what do they actually mean? What can a heavy tank do that a medium tank can't? Why make light tanks at all? Are tank destroyers even tanks? Will this intro ever end? Today we dive head first into tank classifications, the Iron Triangle and common misconceptions about both. Strap in. This video is sponsored by World of Warships. World of Warships is a free to play game available right now for PC and it's a game where new, free content is released every single month. Whether it's new ships, nations, cosmetics or even ship classes, there's always fresh gameplay to enjoy in the game's stunning 12 vs 12 online arenas. And sometimes this content is even part of a collaboration, like Transformers, Azure Lane or Megadeth. World of Warships has more than 40 unique maps to play on, all of which are stunningly modelled with dynamic weather, new water effects and new textures so you can look sharp on the high seas. And you can play your way, with a number of unique ship classes to choose from. Are you a nimble destroyer, a brawling battleship, or are you providing air support from far away as a carrier? It's up to you. And just as a cherry on top, the game is also available on console. So what are you waiting for? Use my link in the description and use the promo code BRAVO to get a huge free starter pack with 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium time and a whole ship. But yes, the first and maybe the most critical thing to understand is that tanks are heavy. Guns are heavy, engines are heavy and, crucially, armour is heavy. And in essence, that is the crux of the Iron Triangle. Every tank design in history is a balance of these three things. Firepower, protection and mobility. You can't have all three. For example, say you put lots of armour onto your tank to enable it to take lots and lots of punishment. This would move the design this way on the triangle, increasing protection because, obviously, more armour, but decreasing mobility as armour is heavy and the vehicle will therefore be slower. And these trade-offs in the early part of the 20th century led to the creation of three main classifications of tanks, light, medium and heavy. Light tanks were usually for reconnaissance and light infantry support roles, so they are relatively small and fast. High mobility. Because they needed to be small and fast, this pretty much ruled out high caliber guns, which required a large turret and therefore were a lot heavier. So light tanks had relatively low firepower. They also, on account of being fast, couldn't have much armour, so they were also lightly protected. These trade-offs weren't always consistent. For example, the Soviet BT tank would be about here. Decent firepower and incredibly mobile, but with extremely limited protection. Whereas the M3 Stuart would be about here. Decent firepower and pretty good mobility, while staying somewhat protected. Both light tanks, but different philosophies. On the other end of the scale we have the heavy tank. Mobility, no. These vehicles are large, slow and usually mounted incredibly large guns. They would be brought up to destroy any enemy tanks or big fortifications while shrugging off incoming fire. So they had high protection and high firepower but low mobility. Think IS or Tiger. They'd be somewhere here. The British did something a bit weird though and traded some firepower for even more protection in a concept they called the infantry tank. The thinking was that the vehicle would be supporting infantry, so didn't need to move much faster than walking pace. It was also designed to fight enemy infantry and emplacements rather than enemy tanks, so there was less of a need for a huge anti-tank gun and instead they packed on even more armour. Think Matilda II or the Churchill. They weren't great at destroying enemy tanks, but enemy tanks also had a lot of difficulty destroying them. So light tanks and heavy tanks would take up the extremes of the Iron Triangle. You are very clearly sacrificing one or more attributes for another. No tank with excellent protection could realistically be fast, and no tank with excellent mobility could realistically be well protected, and there was a little bit of flexibility in terms of firepower. But in the middle of the Iron Triangle lies the medium tanks. Medium tanks are the equivalent of picking Mario in Mario Kart. They're jacks of all trades, but masters of none. 
Their design philosophy tends to try and balance mobility, firepower, and protection. Essentially, the designs were always just about armoured enough to protect the vehicle from most threats, with a gun just about big enough to deal with most threats in order to retain as much mobility as possible. These vehicles were meant to form the backbone of most armoured forces, powerful and protected enough to blast through enemy defences and deal with most enemy armour, while fast enough to exploit these gaps once they did so. These are your Shermans, T-34s and Panzer IVs. Again, the Brits use a slightly different classification, with less armour but more mobility, and called them cruiser tanks. These were meant to replace the cavalry, using their speed as protection and using it to drive deep into enemy territory. Cruiser 2, 3, 4 and to a lesser extent the Cromwell are all decent examples of this. It did mean there was a massive gulf between their infantry tanks and their cruiser tanks and it was certainly an interesting design doctrine. So, there we have it. You now know the general premise of light, medium and heavy tanks. You'll notice that I haven't actually mentioned weight other than in terms of mobility, but light and heavy definitely imply weight. While heavy tanks are usually heavier than medium tanks, and medium tanks usually heavier than light tanks, this isn't always the case. These classifications may have been about weight when they were first developed in the 1920s, but even by World War II they were strictly doctrinal terms, more about how the vehicles were deployed on a tactical level than their actual mass. For example, the American M24 Chaffee was designed and deployed as a light tank, but weighed a lot more than the Japanese Type 97, which was designed as a medium tank. Anyway, those three are all about trade-off, and how making these trade-offs on the Iron Triangle can allow different designs to succeed in different roles. Now we're going to go off the beaten path a bit and talk about tank destroyers, many of which aren't technically tanks, but I'll explain more later. Tank destroyers were popularised in the Second World War, when it became clear to many that tank armour was increasing at a pace which was much faster than their armament, and it became a necessity to deploy large calibre, high velocity anti-tank guns in a more mobile role, usually on the back of utility vehicles or less critical tank chassis. And it will become clear quite soon that my beloved Iron Triangle has some limitations. I'm going to split tank destroyers into two sort of subcategories that I've made up. So we have classic tank destroyers, and modern tank destroyers. Classic tank destroyers were designed for tank on tank combat. They often had very large guns, mounted in a casemate structure, with a large amount of frontal armour to enable them to absorb hits from the tank they were trying to destroy. This would put them in a similar zone as the heavy tank. But classical tank destroyers very rarely have a turret, and instead use a casemate. This was a lot lighter and roomier than a turret, but came with the trade-off that you were a lot less flexible you could only shoot directly in front of you. Examples of these would be the Stugs, Jagdpanzers, as well as the SU and ISU series. They have high firepower, high protection and decent mobility, but it does come at the cost of flexibility and ergonomics, a trade-off that the Triangle does not really recognise. Anyway, the other type are the modern tank destroyers. These are designed to outmanoeuvre enemy vehicles on both a strategic and a tactical level, rushing to meet an armoured advance to engage enemy units with their powerful guns. So, these vehicles would trade protection for firepower and mobility, sort of like a light tank. The Americans championed this concept, with their M18 Hellcat being an excellent example. Extremely fast, little armour and a powerful gun, usually mounted in a turret to allow the vehicle to remain flexible on the battlefield. Specification wise, these will look suspiciously similar to a light tank, but will usually have less protection and a bigger gun. But like I said, it is less about the numbers and more about how they're used. I'd argue that vehicles like the Panzerjägers would also fall into this category, but these were less about the actual design and more about finding a way to use obsolete tank chassis. Anyway, I hope that made some sort of sense, because I'm about to drop a bomb on you and my nice triangle. Just after the war ended, the British revealed a new tank, the Centurion. It had a large gun, it had great armour, and it was very mobile, thus defying the laws of the triangle and ruining everything I've just said. Welcome to the era of the main battle tank, or MBT. As the Second World War had progressed, engines stayed roughly the same size and weight, but got a lot more powerful. Simultaneously, guns became a lot more powerful, but were much lighter and more compact. This meant that, for the first time, 
you could mount a lot of armor, a lot of gun, and remain mobile, creating, in theory, the perfect tank design. This was a very transitional period, and in the early Cold War, and even into the 1960s, countries would deploy light and heavy tanks alongside their MBTs, with heavy tanks mounting these monstrous 120mm guns and obscene armour, just to say relevant. But as the MBTs started to mount compact but incredibly powerful guns like the L7 or the U5TS, while gaining light, composite armour that outperformed the heavy tanks, the heavy tank classification slowly ceased to exist. The MBT did it better, but cost and weighed a lot less. The MBT also had an effect on tank destroyers. The classic tank destroyer died with the heavy tank. You could mount a big gun and a lot of armour without sacrificing the turret, and MBTs were very capable anti-tank platforms. The modern tank destroyer still exists though, because in the 1950s and 60s, something fun was invented, the anti-tank guided missile. Now, even the smallest vehicle would be capable of tank destroying, and a tank destroyer could be any platform with a few ATGMs on top, be it an APC like the Swingfire or the M901, or an armoured car like the Humvee or the BRDM. At this point, some of these vehicles are hardly tanks at all, but I'm sure you could argue it. So what about light tanks? How are they still relevant? The fact is that there's still an advantage to being small. Drones and satellites are great at gaining information, but a light vehicle carrying some blokes with binoculars will always be indispensable. Another reason they still exist is that very, very few MBTs, if any, are air mobile. MBTs are fast, well protected, and pack a punch, but are usually very heavy, so cannot be dropped out of an aircraft to support airborne infantry. That's where the light vehicles like the Sheridan or the CVRT family came in. Not as capable perhaps, but light enough to be useful for infantry support or reconnaissance. That being said, the role of the light tank has been taken over slightly by infantry fighting vehicles, MRAPs or heavy armoured cars, but they do still exist. So there you have it. Tank Classification 101 I did see something online the other day that suggested that the iron triangle be replaced with the steel hexagon for modern vehicles, with mobility, lethality, autonomy, adaptability, connectivity and survivability at the apexes, but that just doesn't seem as fun. How do you measure connectivity or autonomy? Don't answer that. Thank you again to World of Warships for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Remember to register through the link below and use the code BRAVO to get a pile of free stuff doubloons, credits, premium time, and an entire ship. Don't miss out. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I do hope you learned something, and please do subscribe to keep up with my next few uploads. And of course, thank you to my patrons for continuing to support me and the channel. I'll see you all in the next one.